Please won't you pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. <laughs> Following Jesus means being maladjusted to the world as it is. I struggled with what I was going to say to you today. I ditched, I actually ditched my sermon topic. It's, it's June, God, June is hard. <laughs> I know that celebrity deaths are not the focus of the church, but I also know that this week has been triggering for some of us. So for those of you who have lost loved ones to suicide, the death of Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain brings that all back. And for those of us who struggle with depression and have been on the brink ourselves, the death of high profile celebrities can make it all seem so much more real and possible and terrifying. So if you are part feeling particularly thrown this week, because that's you, I just wanted you to know that I'm here. 617-717-4011 is my cell phone number. Tattoo it on your arm, write it down, don't care what you do. I have cards in the back of the church on the way out the door, you can grab one if you forget my cell phone number, and you can find it everywhere on the internet. And if you are not someone who has depression right now, and you know someone who is suffering, call them. Reach out. Do not hesitate. It matters. Your life matters. To me, your life matters to God. Your life matters to a whole lot of people. Your life matters to this beautiful and brutal and broken world. So I found a chilling quote from Anthony Bourdain yesterday that said, I have the best job in the world. If I'm unhappy, it's a failure of imagination. Yikes. That sounds like a big old trap to me. If I'm unhappy, it's because I failed? Well, that's a lie. If Satan, the accuser, sits on your shoulder and whispers that to you in your ear, cast that demon out. We know that depression is not simply unhappiness. It is not fixed by a good job or the right relationship or a great family or world travel or lots of money. It's a hole. And it's a hole that so many of us occasionally just can't see our way out of or climb out of. It's not a failure on our part. It's just like quicksand Depression certainly isn't helped by the people who come along and tell you to put a smile on your face, amen? amen. <laughs> it's not fixed by others pointing out all the things that you should be happy about. And worse, shaming yourself for failing to be appreciative of what you have is even more poisonous and punishing. We beat ourselves up. Suicide is not a failure on an individual's part, but sometimes it is the result of a collective failure. So while our violent crime and murder rates have dropped to all-time lows in the United States, our suicide rates have gone up. They haven't just gone up. They've risen sharply, 30% since 1999. 
just let that sink in for a second, 30%. Suicide has been declared a public health crisis, it is. And as a country, we are becoming more of a danger to ourselves than others. We have a crisis of meaning on our hands. Well, that's just part of the crisis, but it's an important part. The majority of Americans live in suburbs dominated by garages and not front porches, right? We socialize mostly from behind a screen. We are so fearful of each other that we don't let our kids go outside to play with the neighbors. We don't even know our neighbors. We are profoundly disconnected. So there was an article in USA Today by Kirsten Powers yesterday. She says that we are convinced of the false premise that if we only get that big raise, a new house, or have children, we will finally be happy. But we won't. In fact, in many ways, achieving all your goals provides the opposite of fulfillment. It lays bare instead the truth that there is nothing you can purchase, possess, or achieve that will make you feel fulfilled over the long term. Rather than pathologizing the despair and emotional suffering that is a rational response to a culture that values people based on an over-escalating financial and personal achievements, we should acknowledge that something is very wrong. We should stop telling people who yearn for a deeper meaning in life that they have an illness or need therapy. Instead, we need to help people craft lives that are more meaningful and built on a firmer foundation than just personal success. So man, that preached to me yesterday, that preached to me, because I struggle with depression myself, and no amount of personal achievement has made it go away, quite the contrary. We call it a mental illness, but depression seems to me to be a completely rational response to just being alive in a brutal world. We've pathologized depression as if those of us who have it are somehow maladjusted. Well, we should be maladjusted. We should be maladjusted to a world in which people are starving both for food and for meeting. We should be maladjusted to a world in which traumatized children are taken away from their Asylum-seeking parents as young as four and put in cages and warehouse detention centers, terrified and alone. We should be maladjusted to a world in which women are sexually harassed and assaulted and who die every day at the hands of their partners. We should be maladjusted to a world in which mass shootings are a daily occurrence. We should be maladjusted to a world in which black and brown bodies and lives are laid waste, where God-imaged people are continually treated as though their lives don't matter, we should be maladjusted. We should be maladjusted to the truth that the future of human life on our warming planet is uncertain. We should be maladjusted to our profound disconnection from each other most of all. It is not normal. It's not godly. So don't let people gaslight you into distrusting your own sanity because you feel awash in despair over the world as it is now, okay? Our reading from Mark today features the powerful religious leaders of his time attempting to gaslight Jesus, right? We're only in the third chapter of Mark now, so Jesus' ministry is only just beginning. And people are beginning to question whether Jesus is a little unhinged. First of all, his preaching is getting more urgent, and he is increasingly seeming a little manic to the crowd, yes? 
And second, he isn't fitting into social norms and expectations. Sure, he's been healing people, he's been casting out demons, and that's great, but he's been performing these miracles on the Sabbath, which is a big no-no. He's breaking laws, and that feels dangerous to those who have been coming to see him. They come anyway, but the crowd is beginning to wonder. He's gone out of his mind, the people start to say. Even his own family tries to silence him, right? In the scripture, they run to the scene to restrain him, to hold him back. The crowds aren't the only ones who are worried about this Jesus. Even his mom is worried. What he's doing has implications for the world as it is becoming more like the world as it should be. It has implications. People in power know that it is dangerous when the hopeless start hoping. When the people pushed to the margins start to believe that their lives matter, that is dangerous. People get uppity when they are given the gift of dignity and worth. So the religious leaders figure they should use their skills and their knowledge of the law to undermine Jesus' ministry before it gets out of hand. So in this scene, they call in the big guns to do it. They call in the scribes, the highly trusted biblical scholars, and the scribes deliver their verdict. Jesus is possessed by Satan as a ruler of demons, he casts out demons, they say. But Jesus refuses to be gaslit. That doesn't make any sense, he says. How can Satan cast out Satan? A house divided against itself cannot stand. It is not demonic to be maladjusted to empire, he says. It is not demonic to be maladjusted to suffering. It is not demonic to provide hope and healing to the hopeless. It is not demonic to tell people that their lives matter. It is not demonic to be maladjusted to false piety. It is not demonic to be maladjusted to profound disconnection from one another. It is not demonic to be maladjusted to the way things are in a world ruled by Satan's power. Satan's end has come, Jesus declares, and our job is to prepare for the coming reign of God. The love revolution is coming. Jesus might sound crazy to others when he proclaims this, and you may too sound crazy to others when you proclaim this, because I know you proclaim this in the world, First Church in Sterling. Yes, the love revolution is coming. You know it. But it is better to be a fool for love than an agent of empire's evil. Can I get an amen? Be fools for love. We're saying amen now, but if Jesus came back today as a street preacher, we would probably all think he was nuts. And if he got too out of hand, we would probably lock him up in a facility rather than listen to a word he said. Since this country is not apt to pay for mental health treatment that much anymore, he'd likely end up dying for, in a for-profit jail rather than in a state-run psychiatric ward, isn't that right? And Westboro Baptist Church will most certainly picket Jesus' funeral because Jesus is maladjusted to false teachings about who is in and who is out of God's circle of kinship. Jesus proclaims a holy covenant between God and all people. His family is all who do the will of God, he says. The coming reign of God will be defined by this sort of offensive inclusivity where all are inextricably connected, where all are treated as beloved by God, where all have purpose, where all are connected, where no one is alone. A house divided cannot stand.
Kelly J. Brown writes, this is a call to radical community where we are so connected to each other, we will journey with each other through every circumstance. This is the moment that we must admit individualism, violence, and disconnection is the author of much of our suicidal ideations. And we are called to love people for who they are as long and as best as we can while understanding that every person has a universe of thought to which we may not be privy. If we want to produce an atmosphere where suicide is reduced, then do justice, love mercy, create safe and courageous spaces, love people, stop oppressing, cease warring, resist selfishness, live as though all lives matter, support the unhoused and the ostracized, honor people's pain without one-upmanship or undoing their story to fit a more comforting frame, accept and honor your children when they come out, stop overworking people for pennies, apologize when you are wrong and do better, heal from your racism, your sexism, your classism, your isms, and do no harm, be held accountable Listen with curiosity. Trust and believe in people. Balance, competition, and cooperation. Love the ones God sends to you instead of discarding them like trash. Beloved, fight the despair that comes from disconnection with radical connection instead. Be maladjusted to empire and oriented toward Jesus' family values instead. Those values say that all children are our children, all people are our people. When one of us suffers, all suffer. We can save lives together. All we have to do is answer the call, all we have to do is show up. Our salvation is completely bound up in one another's. I love you, and God loves you. Your life matters. We like having you around. So just stay put, okay? Amen.